The next session will, figure, uh, will feature short five-minute talks by leaders of nine different integrative medicine centers and programs in the Boston area, six at Harvard Medical School, plus Boston Medical Center and Tufts Medical Center. Chairing this session will be Dr. Vitaly Napadal, who is an associate professor of radiology at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at Mass General Hospital. Although the Martino Center is not itself a center for integrative medicine, it is an important element of the integrative medicine network in Boston, since it, it has an ongoing NIH-funded program project on acupuncture and collaborates in its neuroimaging studies with many of the centers for integrative medicines that will be represented in this session. So Dr. Napadao is sitting over there, Are you? and we'll take it from you. Test one, two, everybody can hear me, excellent. So um, it's a real pleasure to have some of the uh, leaders from some of the largest centers in Boston here to present as well. And um, I will be introducing you by name in order and please uh, keep your comments to the allotted time. Thank you very much. So the first speaker will be um, Dr. Peter Wayne, who is the research director at Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Peter, please. Welcome back. So as um, Helen mentioned in her opening remarks, um, research at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine is inspired by a broader definition of integrative medicine that not only includes coordinating the delivery of, of conventional care with complementary therapies, but also consciously trying to dissolve the artificial boundaries uh, between sub-disciplines of conventional medicine and also linking um, basic physiological processes to treatment mechanisms um, and to more of a systems perspective of healthcare delivery. So it's our opinion that within that integrative systems view, the concept of silos doesn't really make sense. And this is our thoughts on where silos in conventional medicine should be going. So within this less siloed uh, perspective of medicine, our research program is centered around three areas of focus, and that's on musculoskeletal health, healthy aging, and mind-body exercise. And our research agendas within those themes span the full translational spectrum from basic research using tissue and animal models to comparative effectiveness and cost-effectiveness studies um, that would uh, ideally target health policy issues. And to give you an idea of our collaborative work, and our work really does uh, integrate a number of different institutes uh, that are represented here today, I just wanted to give you a taste of three of our projects representing that spectrum. So <clears throat> the first one is some lovely work that uh, is led by Dr. Langevin's lab, and it uses a mouse model of uh, inflammation to study how physical stretching um, uh, in some ways, this looks a little bit like mouse yoga, um, impacts local tissue and systemic levels of inflammation and how this inflammation impacts connective tissue. The diagram in the upper right is an ultrasound image of the thickness and a sense of the fibrotic nature of tissue uh, before and after stretching. And then how those influence um, functional uh, aspects, and these are little finger footprints of, of how mice work. And some of this work is now being expanded to and translated into a number of human uh, clinical and, and basic physiological studies related to stretch and connective tissue. The second study, just to give you a taste of what we do, um, has to do with mind-body interactions doing the very practical aspect of walking and whether we can train older adults or those with movement impairments um, to be able to simultaneously do a motor task and think in the real world. This is where the rubber hits the road in terms of mind-body medicine. And many falls and, and injuries happen when people are distracted. And a presumption underlying mind-body medicine is that it better integrates these cognitive motor processes. So on the top, you see a woman walking without a distraction. And you can see she's walked faster than the same person walking with a distraction. But also the quality of that walking, the regularity of the gait um, is quite different. And that arrhythmicity in the bottom panel gives you a, a sense of 
the inter, um, interference of a cognitive task, and we're wondering whether Tai Chi and related practices can make you look more like the upper panel while you're being distracted, and we're seeing some nice results in that. The final study is a pragmatic, what we call an observational study, of back pain patients where we're comparing the relative effectiveness and importantly, like one of our speakers uh, from BU, the cost effectiveness um, of care provided by our entire OSHA clinical team, which is led by Dr. Levy, our leader. Um, and we let the team do whatever they want. This is a very naturalistic study. And, um, and I explicitly made a big, thick black box. This is what we call a black box experiment. We don't really manipulate what happens within that box. We want to see how that happens, uh, the outcomes are occurring naturalistically. And we compare that to a, a group of another 150 patients who receive their care elsewhere at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So that's uh, getting close to the end of my allotted time. Um, I hope this gives you a little bit of an overview of the work we do, and uh, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And by the way, just a really quick announcement. There will be a panel following these talks, so please uh, keep your comments till that time. The next speaker will be uh, Dr. Greg Friccioni. He's the director of the Benson Henry Institute of Mind-Body Medicine at Mass General Hospital. Great. I want to thank Drs. Langevin and Wayne and Meta and Levy for inviting me here today. This is really spectacular being here with these wonderful colleagues. Um, and uh, that talk from Dr. Barabasi was uh, just uh, really, really stimulating. And I think we're going to form this amazing hub community. And through preferential attachment, we're going to make a big, big splash around here. So. Um, BHI. I'm blessed to be the director of BHI. We're inspired every day by Dr. Benson, who you heard from this morning, um, in our mission. Our mission really is to try to optimize health and well-being um, in everybody, uh, try to create a real community of care at Mass General, but also in the com local community uh, and the region, and increasingly uh, globally, which is uh, remarkably gratifying. Um, we're, we're also focused on public health as a strategy. Um, you know that, that in the 21st century, non-communicable diseases are going to sink us. I read something from the World, the world Economic Forum, said by 2030, it costs the world about $47 trillion, these stress-related non-communicable diseases. So we really have to get off our duff and learn as much as we can about how to reduce stress and build resiliency. So that's part of what we're trying to do at BHI as well. And we're trying to do that by advancing our understanding of stress and how to reduce it and how to build resiliency through research and education. And our research, we have a wonderful director of research, John Denninger, education initiative, as you heard this morning, Marilyn Wilcher, and our clinical programs, uh, Dr. Mehta uh, is our medical director. We start with integrative med uh, medical evaluations, and oftentimes patients are, are deemed appropriate for our stress management and resiliency training program, about which we're doing a lot of research. Uh, we have specialty programs looking at um, inflammatory bowel diseases, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, we have programs now in pediatrics, uh, again, in um, functional bowel disorders, in oncology, um, geriatrics, uh, cardiology, et cetera, et cetera. As Herb mentioned this morning, we're working closely with the military, um, trying to find ways to reduce post-traumatic stress and to build resiliency in our uh, wounded warriors. Um, we have an educational initiative, and we're getting more and more into um, childhood stress because of adverse childhood events. As you all know, it leads to so much downstream pathology, um, and that, too, is sinking us and leading to non-communicable diseases. Globally, we are getting more and more call from all over the world. It shouldn't surprise us that the Middle East is, is calling uh, uh, for stress reduction. And we have programs now in Turkey, Lebanon. Uh, uh, and um, as Herb mentioned, we are training uh, trainers, basically, who will hopefully bring our program in stress reduction resiliency enhancement to um, um, caregivers in Liberia. Um, for obvious reasons. We're also involved in sports, as John Henry is our benefactor. We're getting more involved with Red Sox. For some reason, behavioral health is, is now a big topic there. 
Um, and caregiver stress is another tsunami which is affecting this country. 61 million lay caregivers, uh, 21 hours a week on average. So we have to do more in terms of reducing stress and building resiliency there. So our, in our research, we have um, um, a study which we think is very important from uh, NCAM looking at biomarkers and stress management. Um, we have a very interesting study looking at multiple myeloma precursor states, MGUS and um, uh, uh, smoldering myeloma. Uh, we're looking at physiology, methylation studies, other epigenetic studies, and so on. I won't go through the whole list. But our big focus is on, on um, genomics, epigenetics. To date, a lot on transcriptomics, but we also were getting involved in other epigenetic uh, approaches as well as uh, neuroimaging. In the future, as I mentioned, we're really heavily into the public health model. What can we do um, to advance primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention of these noncommunicable diseases? And we want to really try to unravel that interpenetration of a mind, brain, and body because we think that that is going to lead to advances in management and in public health. And we are also involved in preparing the next generation of all sorts of caregivers, um, hoping that they'll really get excited by mind-body medicine and integrative medicine, because that's what we're going to need in the future in this century. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Jennifer Ligibel, um, Director of the Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thank you. Am I supposed to? Just hit the arrow. Arrow, okay. There we go. Uh, so the Leonard P. Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies at Dana-Farber is dedicated to integrating the practice of complementary medicine into traditional cancer treatment. Our center both provides services and education for patients, their families, and providers at Dana-Farber, and also studies the effects of therapies on symptoms of cancer therapy and side effects. Now, the Zakem Center was founded about 15 years ago by Lenny Zakem as he was battling multiple myeloma. He found acupuncture and massage to be very helpful as he was dealing with what ultimately was a terminal illness. Fifteen years later, the need for these services in cancer patients has become even greater. This time period has seen enormous advances in cancer therapies. Patients are being diagnosed earlier, our treatments have gotten better, and that's resulted in millions and millions of people who are walking around with a prior history of cancer. As an oncologist, I recognize that many times the lives we give back to people are vastly different than the lives that they came in with at the time of their diagnosis, and people are living with side effects from their therapy and symptoms from their cancer. And so the Zakem Center really seeks to integrate therapies that are not traditionally part of the medical aspects of oncology care into the treatment of our patients. Today's talk is mostly about research, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research initiatives that we've undertaken at Dana-Farber through the Zakem Center, and many of these have focused on acupuncture, different ways of alleviating side effects and symptoms. Our first project is a current an ongoing effort led by Weedong Lu, who's here today, that looks at the power of acupuncture to alleviate neuropathy, which is a symptom that is seen in many diseases but has a different pathophysiology, we think, as a result of many common cancer therapies and can lead to disability in many patients who are cured of their diseases. So this study randomizes people to an immediate or delayed acupuncture puncture intervention and looks at the impact on symptoms of neuropathy. The Zakem Center is also very involved in healthy living. We recognize a holistic approach to helping our patients with nutrition, physical activity, and stress management. So we've started a pilot study looking at a 15-week small group-based program helping people to manage their weight, alleviate stress, and sleep better. And this is something that is in a pilot phase now, and we hope to be able to roll this out as a clinical program available to all Dana-Farber patients and eventually staff in the coming years. 
Our final project is a study that was completed and demonstrates another outreach from the Zakem Center to a specific disease center in helping patients deal with the side effect of therapy. This is a project, again, led by Weedong that looked at acupuncture um, as a means of alleviating symptoms in head and neck cancer patients who develop a lot of difficulties with breakdown of their mucosal tissues and dry mouth as a result of their therapy that really stops them from being able to get nutrition and hydration during and after their cancer treatment. I want to finish by a little bit more of a description of our center, as I know some of you may not be as familiar with this. The Zakem Center um, definitely has a research focus, but also has very robust clinical services, and we offer both group-based programming and individual services. Our individual services focus on acupuncture, massage, and Reiki, and then we also offer group programming, which is entirely free to patients and their families. Movement-based services like yoga, qigong, and tai chi. We also offer meditation and mindfulness, and nutrition and healthy living programming. And the final part of the Zakem Center is really education and outreach. We are really very much trying to partner with the medical oncologists and the surgeons and the radiation oncologists to enhance the care of cancer patients. And so this takes the form of education. We have an annual Lenny Lecture, which I know that we've had some esteemed members of this group who've spoken at this in the past. Uh, we also take part in a lot of the disease center programming for their patients to really let them know what kind of services are available to them and what the growing research uh, demonstrates the values of these services for cancer patients are. We also have started some outreach programs to expand the reach of the Zakem Center within Dana-Farber by offering um, massage to patients as they're hospitalized for months on end for things like bone marrow transplantation. We offer Reiki and massage services during infusion for both adult and pediatric patients. And we also are starting some infusion and group-based acupuncture programs for common symptoms like nausea. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Corey Ye, who is the director of Harvard Medical School Research Fellowship in Integrative Medicine at Beth Israel. Thank you. So my task was to, in three to five minutes, um, give you a snapshot of what's going on at the Beth Israel Deaconess. And I thought when I was listening to the poster at Medley, wow, three to five minutes is like a luxury. So anyways, um, OK, I have three slides. Okay. So um, the cornerstone of uh, the integrated medicine program at the Beth Israel is really our postgraduate educational initiative. Um, so the BI is home to the Harvard Medical School Research Fellowship in Integrative Medicine. Um, and this is a NIH NCHEM funded um, program uh, through a T32 grant. It's a three-year postdoctoral program uh, for the most part uh, our fellows have been MDs and PhDs, but it's really a program that's open to other uh, graduates of uh, uh, other uh, doctoral programs as well. Um, the focus of the fellowship is really to uh, prepare individuals for a career in academic medicine um, to do research uh, in complementary and integrative medicine. And much of the training um, in the research methodology comes from coursework at the School of Public Health, the Harvard School of Public Health, where uh, fellows get the opportunity to earn a master's in public health. Um, and then really the mentored research project is the crux of the fellowship. Uh, the projects are actually fellow driven in terms of their own interests, um, but we do have uh, mentors um, and collaborators across all disciplines, um, neurology, pediatrics, um, you know, you name it, um, and across all Harvard institutions um, as well as, uh, as BU. Um, so we've graduated over 25 fellows uh, since the inception of the fellowship in 2000. Um, and many of the graduates actually are here in this room today, and I think you know three of us on the panel, and um, and, and a lot of and all of our current fellows are here as well. Um, these fellows have really um, graduates of the program have really gone on to lead the uh, integrative medicine research as well as clinical programs, um, both here at Harvard as well as nationwide. So we're very proud. In terms of research um, at the Beth Israel Deaconess, um, the first bullet again is really just to you know highlight that um, the research that our fellows and and their mentors do is really a very important. Uh, 
piece of our research portfolio at the Beth Israel. Um, this is just a, a you know a partial list of um, a few of the research projects that fellows. Um, recent fellows or current fellows have been engaged in. Um, so the first, um, Mindfulness and Obesity, Sarah Chaco, who uh, is one of our third year fellows, um, has been uh, working in that area. Uh, there have been other fellows who've worked on projects uh, looking at mindfulness interventions for TBI, traumatic brain injury, uh, looking at um, meditation effects for cognitive function, um, as well as for headache pain. Um, Selma Holden, who's one of our second year fellows, um, is currently conducting a clinical trial of prenatal yoga for pregnancy-related back pain. Um, and then two of our first year fellows, um, Noelle Chan and uh, Nina Shinde, are very interested in neurophysiology of mind-body, uh, looking at um, addictions, uh, anxiety, as well as um, interest in aging-related biomarkers. Um, and then finally, Catherine Hall, who's a, a third year fellow, has been um, interested in st studying the genetic correlates of the placebo response. Um, outside of the fellowship, uh, there's also a mind-body research um, program, mind-body medicine research program within the Division of General Medicine. Um, and again, these are just a, a few of the studies that, that um, just to showcase the, the collaborations that we have uh, across, across Harvard as well as the um, surrounding institutions. So the BEAM study and the LEAP study um, are two NIH and CAM funded R01s, uh, multi-million dollar five-year grants uh, that look at um, mind-body exercise, Tai Chi, and meditative breathing for uh, patients with COPD. Um, and this is a collaborative effort between the BI uh, with the Boston VA as well as Brigham and Women's. And actually for uh, the LEAP study, we have uh, collaborations for recruitment sites um, all across the city, including um, BU, uh, Mount Auburn, Faulkner, Brockton Hospital, the South Shore. Uh, the Gentle Rehab Study is another collaborative effort with Brown University. Um, this is an R34 developmental grant uh, developing a Tai Chi intervention for cardiovascular patients who uh, um, have had an event but otherwise refuse conventional cardiac rehab. Um, and then just to say that there's also um, um, some active research going on in the Division of Gerontology, mainly focused at Tai Chi uh, for frail elders. We don't have much time um, left for clinical initiatives, but I just want to say that uh, uh, there, there are some clinical initiatives um, in terms of integrative medicine going on at the BI. The Cheng Sui Center for Integrated Health um, is a fairly new uh, center over the last, uh, I'd say, two to three years, um, which is within Healthcare Associates, which is the primary care clinic at the Beth Israel. Um, and again, offering group classes as well as individual um, yoga, tai chi, mindfulness, meditation, massage, acupuncture, as well as physician, integrative medicine, and mind-body consults. And there's also some clinical initiatives going on in the Department of Neurology as well through the Brain Fit Center, um, tai chi, and other mind-body interventions being offered to patients um, there as well um, through the Parkinson's and Movement Disorders Clinic. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeh. The next speaker will be Chuck Birdie. Um, from the, he's the Division Chief of Pain Medicine, Pain Treatment Center at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, so I'm gonna describe work that goes on at Children's Hospital uh, in a number of different programs, number of different departments. Um, there isn't a uh, unified integrative medicine program at Children's at present. There was for a number of years in the past. It now resides in many parts of the hospital. Um, and I'm going to briefly mention some of the research and clinical initiatives uh, in the areas shown here. Um, a lot around pain management, my own area of interest, brain imaging, placebo, integrative nursing consortium, many of the areas that are listed there. Um, our pain management program at Children's is the first and busiest pediatric pain program in the world, and for the past 26 years, it has been integrative from the start. So it has always involved mind-body approaches, it's always involved exercise and physical therapies, and it's always involved a component of research along with clinical practice. A major part of it is understanding how to intervene in a cycle of disability in many chronic pain conditions, how to prevent progression to chronicity uh, in adults. 
we have a particular interest in a condition known as complex regional pain syndrome or traditionally reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is in many ways, I think, a quintessential mind-body condition, which has a robust literature in pediatrics. Our, we did the first randomized trials of showing that an intensive program of exercise, desensitization, cognitive behavioral therapy, and overcoming fear of movement could result in improvement in pain measures and disability measures. And we've continued to study this uh, with a series of uh, studies over the last 20 years um, and to study how, it, how best to intervene, what delivery models for rehabilitative treatment are effective and efficient. Um, we have a very active program in functional brain imaging. We've collaborated for many years with a group led by David Borsuk, Lino Becerra, and their colleagues uh, who were previously at McLean. We're able to recruit them to have their base at Children's, and they, along with Laura Simons, Alyssa LaBelle, Neville Sethna, myself and others, have been looking at structural and functional changes in the brain in a number of pediatric chronic pain conditions, relationship to pain-related fear and avoidance Relate, and what is modifiable by a very rapid program of rehabilitation. So showing that in as little as three weeks, you can reverse some of the structural and functional changes, changes in patterns of functional connectivity, in patterns of descending inhibition, in resting state networks, uh, in kids with CRPS, uh, as well as related studies in pediatric migraine. So uh, again, a major area of research is trying to understand uh, imaging correlates of mind-body therapies. Many people here are interested in placebo. Ted Kapjuk and many others have been interested in therapeutic encounter and placebo and all the broad areas of that. Um, my own work for a long time has been in analgesic clinical trials in children. And for since Beecher and colleagues in the 1950s, the role of placebo in clinical practice, but, but also its role in understanding how analgesics work and how you study and test analgesics has been important. Those are hard enough to work on in adults. They are m even harder to work on in children, and there's a set of ethical and practical constraints in how one uh, has a child who has severe pain and how one considers the possibility of a placebo for them. And so we've worked with the FDA on a committee on how to do trials with immediate rescue analgesic sparing approaches as a ethically desirable way to use the scientific benefits of placebo control without uh, subjecting kids to unrelieved pain. Um, Joe Kosowski and Carolina Donato recently did a systematic review and meta-analysis on how well these trials work in, they started with about 4,000 pediatric trials and did a nice analysis of their features. Wan Chi Lin and colleagues have studied acupuncture in children for many years, acupuncture for pain, for nausea, for emergence delirium, studied features of uh, how you do clinical effectiveness and efficacy trials in children. There's a, a whole group of people at Children's who are doing integrative therapies in a number of departments, and I just want to mention several who are here today. So Emily Davidson is a uh, physician, MPH uh, yoga instructor who works with children with developmental disabilities um, and who has received funding to look at yoga and urban Zen integrative therapy. Um, there's a group of nurses at Children's who've had a long-standing interest in a number of integrative therapies in massage, in Reiki, in therapeutic touch, uh, and in collaborating with groups of nurses throughout the Harvard hospitals on, uh, on these approaches. Um, there's been a lot of previous epidemiologic work. When Kathy Kemper ran the integrative medicine program, there's a lot of epidemiology of uh, complementary and alternative medicine use in children, and this has been continued in some staff survey work. Recently, the, a program called the Center for Families has emerged as a home for complementary and alternative medicine at Children's, and I think will be a place where, where these types of um, therapies and 
effectiveness research will, will blossom at Children's because of a core group of people now based there uh, who've taken on an interest. So that's a short whirlwind on some of the work at Children's. Thanks. <laughs>